Okay. It's working. Yep. All right. Welcome, folks, to another lecture of CS3032. Um, today we're going to be um, just talking a little bit about uh, Milestone 3, what that can entail. Um, and hopefully, I won't be speaking for too long. Every time I say I won't take up too much of your time, I end up talking for like 30 minutes. So hopefully, we'll kind of get through it in 20 ish. Uh, minutes and I'll give you the rest of the time to actually start working on your milestone because I, I want you to start working today. Um, I'm splitting this into two and a half pieces. One of the half pieces we're gonna, um, I'm gonna try and ask, I finished talking early, I'm gonna try and ask you to complete today. Um, and then the rest will be um, checkpoint one which was, was going to be due on Friday. And then the final deliverable will be uh, the following Friday or, or um, for non-seniors, we'll see if we can push that a little bit into the final period, if that's helpful. Okay, other, um, other announcements. Um, the makeup exam for um, exam two is active. Um, you can take it anytime between now and 3 a.m. Um, so it's gonna close at 6, uh, 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. So if, you, if you're set to take the, um, the makeup exam, please do so by that time. Um, we don't have any activities due today, but we have an activity from yesterday that was due at the start of um, today's um, session. Questions? Yeah. So we don't have any for the day. I thought I saw something on the schedule that was tomorrow at two. Is that for today? That's, I think, the quiz from yesterday, I probably had put it on till, till Saturday. Uh, so you could, you could, whatever it says on Moodle, just follow. Uh, yeah. Questions? Okay. So in Milestone 3, we're going to tie all the loose pieces together and implement a multi level feedback queue scheduler in the Linux kernel. So we're going to take our kernel module, we're going to add things to it, we're going to extend it so that we can schedule threads according to the multi-level feedback queue um, scheduling policy. Um, and we're going to do that, we can, we're going to do that by overtaking, put it in between quotes, the core Linux scheduler. And the way we overtake the core Linux scheduler is by modifying task states or process states. So what we're going to do is if I want to, process, to put a process to sleep, I'm going to in intentionally trick the scheduler into putting it to sleep by changing its state from running to sleep. So this time, when the, this way, when the scheduler runs, the core scheduler, the one that the OS provides, when that core scheduler runs, it's going to look at the state of a certain process. It's going to see, oh, this process should be sleeping. It's going to put it to sleep. So that's how we're going to kind of override whatever decisions the core scheduler has made, we're going to override those by accessing and changing the state of a task inside of a running system. So we're going to assume in our system that all processes behave in a certain, in at least the following map. There will be a little bit of changes, but at least you can assume that this is standard behavior. The process starts, it's going to register with our module, the same thing we did for milestone two, then it's going to run for a while. So do busy work for some time. Then it's going to deregister. Then it's going to exit. So you can assume that at least the process is going to look as follows. Start, register, do stuff, deregister and exit. So all the processes are going to be behaving processes or well behaving processes. What we're going to do is that we're going to. Our scheduler. 
is going to take control of when the process actually runs. So if we have P0 and P1, let's say P0 registered here, and let's say they both be registered, P1 registered a little bit after P0, then our scheduler is going to first schedule P0 for a certain amount of time, then it's going to switch to P1, switch back to P0, and so on. And it's going to move P0 down in the queues as, as a multi-level feedback queue scheduler works, right? But in general, this is the general format, is that the decision of when your process is going to run is up to your kernel model. So the way the um, module is going to be structured is pretty much going to be similar to milestone two, we have our read handler, which we're not going to change at all at this point in time. So we're we're kind of satisfied with whatever we achieved in the reading part. In the writing handler, we're going to have registration, we're going to have deregistration, and we're going to add a new function that's called yield or a new operation that we're going to ask our, our, our provide support for, which is called yield. On the back end, we're still going to have our database of PCBs. And now this will serve a dual purpose. It's our database. And it's our run queue. So what do we mean by the run queue? The run queue is basically, or run queues in MLFQ, um, are the set of queues that are going to form your um, scheduler, right? So you have a level one queue, level two queue, priority zero queue, priority one queue, and so on and so forth. So that linked list is going to serve as the database, and later on, as, as you start building your scheduler, it's going to serve as some form of queuing process. Takes up a lot of time in what sense? Like, if you like modify like three or four different queues, yes, almost yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. That makes sense. There's no scheduling to take So, we're going to see how scheduling happens. Um, it's going to happen in something in a, in a separate kind of place than the actual processes. So, if assuming you have two CPUs, your scheduler is going to be running on one and your process is going to be running. So we're still going to have our timer, and later on we're going to add a bunch of other timers, right? But before we had this structure of work queues here, of works and a work queue, and what we're going to do now is we're going to take that out and we're going to replace it with a kernel prep. And that will serve as our main scheduling algorithm. So the scheduling is going to happen inside of that. Decisions on scheduling are going to happen in the kernel thread that we're going to create. So when we create a kernel thread, we're guaranteed that this kernel thread is going to run on one CPU. And then the process, which is going to be run by a different thread, is going to be run on a different CPU. So that's how we can do scheduling decisions and run processes kind of in a, at the same time or in a, um, in a um, concurrent mode. But as if, as in any case where you have concurrency, as in any case you have um, processes running at the same time, 
we have to worry about locking, we have to worry about synchronization. So these are the things that you should always be mindful of when you're trying to implement your, uh, your schedule. So the goal of today's lecture is to walk you through or to let you um, figure out how do we use the kernel threading interface. So that's what we're going to be doing um, today. And then um, until next Friday, you're going to implement yield and you're going to implement a first in first out scheduler. So a very simple scheduler that schedules things as they arrive, the first in and the first out. And the first in is the first out. And in addition to that, we're going to be using a timer to do um, a round robin scheduler. So if a process does not yield by itself, we will force it, we will yank it off the CPU, force it to be to sleep, and then put another process back on the, 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 the CPU. Okay. All right, so our scheduler is going to be called because, um, or actually, let me say it this way. In our five, in checkpoint one, which is going to be due next Friday, we're going to implement FIFO plus round robin with a quantum of five seconds. So every five seconds, the process is going to be um, descheduled if it's still going. So in our scheduler, there's two places where we should definitely run a schedule. The first place is when a timer expires, which means that when the quantum is over. So every five seconds, I have to run my schedule. So that's how round robin works, right? Every certain amount of time, we did that in user space lab too. We had an alarm. We set that alarm for five, for one second, I, if, if I'm not mistaken. And then every second, we switch processes, right? We go look at the queue. We, we look at our array. We see how which ones are empty, which ones are valid, and then we run those. So this is very similar to. to user space lab two. So the logic is very similar, except it's done in kernel space. So everything you do is going to be done in the kernel and through the kernel schedule. The other place where, we, where we'd want to run our scheduler is with this new operation that we're going to call yield. Yeah. What's the word when one expires? Uh, timer. Yeah. So when um, when we when a process calls yield, this means that it's re voluntarily relinquishing the CPU. It's telling our scheduler that I'm 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 a nice process. I'm just going to give up the CPU for other processes to use. There are two things that you must do when a process yields. First, and most importantly, cancel pending timers. So, and please make sure you always remember to do this, right? I'll, I'll let you know why in a second, and then wake up the scheduler. So why do we need to cancel the pending timers? It's for the following reason. If process P0 is running, and let's say it was brought in at time T0, five seconds later, we were supposed to swap out P0. So we got here, and at T1, we were supposed to swap out P0. P0. But then, Let's say around four seconds, P0 yields. And our scheduler decides to run P1, for example. If we don't cancel this timer, P1 is only going to run for one second, and then we're going to switch back to P0. 
because our scheduler is going to think that, oh, a quantum has expired, and it's going to assume that in this quantum only P0 is running. Right? What we have to do is going to be at this point in time, we're going to cancel T1 and set another timer for time T2, which is T1 plus 5. OK, otherwise it is very easy for a process to game our system. At around 4.5 seconds, it yields. We run another process for 0.5 seconds, and then we switch back to it. Right? It's, it's kind of like a, um, um, a, a way to game, to game the system. This is um, how we prevent those malicious processes from playing around with our schedule. OK. Uh, questions so far? Okay. So the scheduling logic is implemented by the kernel track. And the checkpoint one is going to be first in, first out, plus round robin. Checkpoint two is going to be multi nodal feedback. Okay, so that's a quick overview of what we're going to do in milestone three. We're going to be splitting it out in two and a half pieces. The first piece is the one that we I posted for today's session, um, which is basically just an internal that's then um, then we're gonna um, uh, implement checkpoint one, which is first in first out plus first round plus round robin. Then we implement mean multi-level feedback used in checkpoint. Question. Okay, so last or, or kick start your project is an introduction to kernel threads. So we talked about kernel threads before, which are the threads that run in the kernel. But now we're going to talk about them from a different point of view. And the point of view we're looking at it is from inside the core of the kernel. So now we're no longer standing on the outside calling pthread and pthread is doing the job for us of creating kernel threads. Now we are in the kernel and we want to create a kernel thread to do things for us. So kernel threads are units of execution that are going to run on a certain CPU. So unit of execution that run on a certain CPU. But here's the challenge when implementing kernel threads manually. In your kernel thread handling function, if you do not voluntarily yield the CPU to the core Linux scheduler, the scheduler cannot move you off of that CPU. OK, so if I write a kernel function and I type while one in it, I lost the core of my process of my physical machine because that kernel thread is going to be bound to a CPU and it's never going to be taken off of it unless I specifically voluntarily give up execution. OK, so if there's one thing to remember from today's lecture, which is, is the following. A kernel thread cannot be scheduled out unless manually specified. Okay, so if you get to a point where in your code you're 
your your uh, machine is is going crazy with the fan, you might have messed up in your kernel threads. So be very careful when you're writing your code in there. And I um, I will give you the template of how you would write the code. Then you'll just add your logic. Um, so a kernel thread is nothing but programmatically. It's nothing but a task struct. So everything in the kernel is a task struct. Every unit of execution in the kernel is nothing but a task struct. To create a um, kernel or to, to create a kernel thread, we need to first create a thread handling function, which we'll talk about in a few moments. And second, we're going to use the call to um, I think it's kthread run or run kthread. Kthread run. So we're going to use the call to kthread run. So kthread run will do two things for us. It will first create a kernel thread and two, it will run the kernel thread. Okay, so if you want to create a kernel thread without running it, then you can use kthread create, and that just creates the thread but does not run it directly. You have to run it yourself. So kthread accepts three parameters. So let's put them here. The first is the handler function. The second is an argument to the handler function. And the third is the name of the kernel thread. So you can give it any name you want. So that's how we create a thread. So let's see what happens when the thread starts running. So when this code starts executing. So our thread handling function in this assignment is going to have the following template. There's a while loop, but instead of while one, because we want the scheduler to, to, to always run and to sleep and wake up only when we need it to. So we don't need to run it once and shut down. So instead of while one, we're going to use while not kthread should stop. So kthread should stop reads an atomic bit. So what do we mean by atomic? means that while reading that bit, it's done either fully or not at all. So it's protected by locks. You can think of it as reading the stop bit is protected by locks. You don't have to do it yourself. It's already done for you. So kthread should stop reads a bit in the thread information in the PCB and then checks if that bit is set, it returns true. If that bit is not set, it returns false. OK, so whenever I want to stop a thread, I can set that bit to one. If I want the thread to keep going, I set the bit to zero. So the second thing is we're going to use a call called set current state to task interruptible. And then call schedule in here. So what's the, what what happens when we do this? When the process first comes in, or when the kernel thread first comes in, it's gonna do some initialization here. Then what's gonna happen is that we're, it's gonna tell the CPU, or it's gonna tell the core kernel scheduler to change its state to task interruptible. So which means that I am ready to go to sleep. Task interruptible means that this process is ready to go to sleep, but 
it can be interrupted by software interrupts or hardware interrupts, and it can be awakened from, from its sleep by those interrupts. Then we make a call to schedule, and this will call core kernel schedule. So this, so now there's, you can think of it, we have two levels of schedulers. We have our scheduler in the module, and that will call the core scheduler in the Linux kernel, the one that's provided by default. When this scheduler sees task interruptible, we're going to sleep until someone else wakes us up, or, if I, or um, we receive a signal. OK, now one thing I want you to pay particular attention to is the following. There is a state called task uninterrupted. And it's easy to kind of. Um, mix the two around. If you put a state, a process to task in uninterruptible, you can't kill it. You can't send signals to it. You can't do anything with it except waking it up from your kernel mod. So if you buy a mistake, use task uninterruptible, um, you might end up having to do bad things and need a restart of your machine. So be mindful that you're always using interruptible and not uninterruptible. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to call the core kernel scheduler. The core kernel scheduler is going to do its algorithm, and it's going to look at the state of our kernel thread. So the state of our kernel thread is set to task interruptible, which means that the task wants to sleep. So it will put the task to sleep. It will save its PCB, put it on the sleeping queue, and just never run it again until it's waking up. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to save PCBs. I'm not going to ask you to put things to sleep. You can just do those by calling the kernel schedule. <coughs> and now, since we want this to run, you know, one iteration of scheduling and then stop and then sleep, then one iteration of scheduling, then sleep, then we're going to have to do this at the end as well. So that set current state. task interrupt. OK, now here's the thing you should always pay attention to. And if you want to modify timers. In your code, in your kernel thread code, please, please, please. Do this before you call schedule. So timer modification. OK. So the, the answer to that, why should you do it before the call to schedule is I will leave it for you to think about and figure out. It's very easy to, to figure it out. It's nothing complicated. Nothing has to do with the kernel. It just has to do what happens when the last time I run my scheduler before exiting? Right, so I'll, I'll leave it to you to think about that. Um, if you want to talk about it, then during office hours we'll talk about it. But please make sure you do your kernel modifications before the call to schedule. Your timer modifications before the call to schedule. Questions? Yes. Yes, so in, in for today, we're just going to replace the work queue with um, the, uh, the the kernel thread. So we're just the same work that was done by the work queue before is going to now be done by the kernel thread. And for next Friday, we're just going to replace that code with the FIFO schedule. 
So now where are we going to wake up this thread? So we said there's two, two places. One is the timer. The second is the, um, the yield function. So let's take a look at how do we wake up this thread. So in our timer handler, lucky enough, we have a call provided by the kernel. It's called wake up process. And then you pass the task struct in here. So that when the scheduler goes to sleep, this call to wake up process will wake up the scheduler in here. So after calling wake up process, we continue executing from this point. Okay. So you can think of it as we're doing a swap context, but we're not swapping context with another thread. We're just telling the core kernel scheduler that please throw me off, do something else, and then when wake up thread, when wake up process is called, you jump back into execution where you left off. Now, if you put a thread or a process to task uninterruptible sleep, it can only be waken up by an explicit call to wake up process. So that's why I say, please do not use task uninterruptible, because if by mistake you put a process to sleep uninterruptibly, you can't control C it, you can't sick kill it, you can't do anything to it. It's just gonna be a zombie in your um, in your machine. Okay, until you read. So last thing we wanna talk about is how do we set this bit so in your exit function when you want your scheduler to stop running we just call a function called kthread stop and we pass the task struct to it okay so that's basically gonna go do two things one is set the stop bit and two wake up the thread to run one last time okay so that's so last when you call k thread stop there's going to be one more iteration of your loop that's going to happen because you're going to wake up your thread in here. And one more iteration of your loop is going to happen. So be very mindful of what you're doing in here. Because if you're not careful, you might end up sec faulting because you did something. You scheduled the timer, for example, that's going to go off after you removed your mod. So be very careful that there's one extra one extra iteration of your loop that's going to happen before you break out of a thread should stop. Questions? OK, so I ended up taking too long as usual. Um, uh, for the rest, the rest, we have about 17 minutes. Um, just go to the session information for today's session. There is a document for you to go through. At the end of this document, you should be able to run milestone two exactly as it was in the milestone two, but instead of using a work queue, you're using a, a kernel thread. So we're going to see the same behavior. We're just going to swap out the work queue and put in the kernel. And if you have questions, just let me know and I can answer. Them.